everybody, Kurt Davis here with Real Estate Wealth Coaching, and today I get the privilege of interviewing Stephen Eck and Donna. Stephen, thanks for coming in today. Man, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You're one of the pioneers of my story, so it's, it's fun to come back and chat with you. You know, it's funny, uh, you know, kind of before we, I've got many questions to ask, but before we get into that, uh, last night for homework, I went back and listened to the podcast you know, when I was kind of a little more big into actual podcasting, and I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, I'm going to go to the, go to my page where I have it." It's probably just a few years ago. It was September 14th of 2014. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago. It doesn't. Time flies, but a lot has happened since then and now. Well, I know, and it's funny listening to that to hear where you were at in your real estate investing career at the time. So it's going to be interesting to hear this now. So. Yeah. Um, and, and for those of you who are watching, I will put a link to that very first podcast with Steven. So if you like what you hear today, uh, certainly go and check that one out because uh, it's, it's nice to see when someone starts out. You know, in real estate investing, a lot of people are excited and they get in and they fall out. Right. And they don't do anything. So it's nice to see the ones who have been able to make it happen and stay. But if you're watching this video, get on over to our YouTube page. Real Estate Wealth Coaching, sub hit the subscribe button if you have not already. Uh, and if you watch this interview and you like it, make sure you click the like, uh, leave a comment. We'd love to know what you think. So with that being said, yep. Stephen Mack and Donna, full-time real estate investor That's right. in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. But you were not always a full-time real estate investor. No, I was not. Uh, so what was going on with Stephen Mack and Donna before real estate? Before real estate, I was a musician, so I worked uh, for, I had my own band at the time. We would do like wedding parties, dinner parties, corporate events. Uh, I also played, led worship for some of the local churches. Electric guitar? No, I didn't play electric. <laughs> I played piano. I know. You know piano and, and sing, man, and, and had my own band, and, and that was great, and that's what I did before finding real estate. So... Uh, was was being in the band was that your full time job or, or did you have uh, anything else that you were doing at the same time? No, that was it. That's what I did primarily full time. So I had uh, worked for a couple churches, um, and then just my own band, and that was my full time job. I played at nights and on the weekends. So, um, my do, you do you still play? Not as much as I used to, but yes, I still, uh, really, I don't do any of my private events anymore. I've stopped doing that for a long time, but, uh, you know, I, I play for the church every 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 Sunday. Of still. course. Yeah. I still play drums for my church, too. Yeah, that's cool. Self-taught, I'd yeah. like to point that out. <laughs> cool. Probably not as good as you on piano. <laughs> so, you're, you're full-time with the band, things seem to be going all right. Mm -hmm. Where does real estate come into play? Well, we started making a little bit of money, not a ton, but a little bit. Um, cause my, my private stuff was going well and, um, me and my wife just sat down and said, okay, well, we got a little bit of discretionary income. What are we going to do with this money? And so I started looking at saving, let's, let's save it. Let's put it in an IRA. And I just realized very quickly that I was never going to save my way to like a good retirement. Like I just didn't earn enough and I'd have to earn a lot more than what I was doing. And I didn't really see a path on how to do that. So then it was like, okay. Saving is not going to work. We're going to have to invest. So then I started going down that rabbit hole of just what, how can you invest, what to invest in. I saw stocks. I saw futures. I saw, you know, precious metals. I saw all of that. And I just felt like real estate was more what I could handle just because it seemed like you didn't have to be like a rocket scientist. It's very simple fundamentals um, that, that, that anyone could wrap their mind around. So I just felt like that was the path. Um, so that's kind of what led us into opening the door for that discussion. Now, when you guys did open that door for discussion, in the world of real estate, as you know, there are hundreds upon ways to get involved. Yeah. What were you looking at? Do you remember, was there something specific? Like, were you looking at just, hey, I want to buy houses or I want to flip or wholesale? Like, what was, what did you see? I saw and and still maintain to this day that the power in real estate is in the buy and hold. So initially when I, and I know a lot of people don't get started with like wanting to be a landlord, but that's what I wanted because mm -hmm. I wanted to do a bunch of stuff now, work, get a property and then rent it and then I get paid every single month whether I do that mm -hmm. work or not. So I always saw the power in that passive income. Um, so I wasn't as much interested in the wholesaling or the fixing and flipping. To me, 
that was that's just lucrative high paying jobs you know you got to go out do work then when you get done with the work you get paid but then if you'd stop doing the work you don't get paid now were you guys living in memphis at this time because i know you're from houston right from houston texas originally went to college there and then moved to memphis to go to uh, the university of memphis did you start looking at real estate like like this discussion with your wife was this in houston or was this when you were already living in memphis this is in memphis okay so memphis is kind of where these ideas were birthed. funny story we the, the, we were looking at me and my wife were watching HGTV. I love all those shows. <laughs> we were watching a vacation rental show, <laughs> um, and my wife had this idea. She was like, "Man, we should buy a property in Hawaii at the time." Because I think the person on the show was buying vacation rentals in Hawaii. She was like, "How cool would it be to buy a property in Hawaii, and then we could do like vacation rentals?" But then like. Because we, we've always worked in ministry, and we, we know pastors that are burnt out, never take vacations. And so she was like, let's buy a property in, in Hawaii, uh, fix it up, make it a vacation rental, but then we can let like our pastor friends go on vacation there for free and sure. not charge them to stay in the vacation rental. And that was like the first aha moment of like, man, maybe real estate could be a potential option or avenue for us to invest in. We have not since bought the property in Hawaii to like rent out to or give to people in ministry but um, it's something that we we do want to do eventually but yeah that's kind of how we that 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 popped out into our heads so you guys are talking about real estate you're watching vacation Airbnb type mm-hmm. shows on HGTV yeah. by the way we watch all those too they're great <laughs> yeah. uh, so now what what we're watching shows that's great yeah but now what what's what's the first form of action what do you do I, for me I had to really believe. I I felt like I didn't know enough about real estate to really believe. So I just went on a fact-finding mission. I inundated myself with podcasts, books. I mean, I've read over 100 real estate books easy. Um, I was buying two new books every week, and I was just reading. I was in my car, podcast, this podcast, that podcast. I was inundating myself with the information because I knew that in order for me to step out there and start doing it, I, I just had to believe. And I it was, an, it was a dream, it was an idea, but I didn't have the belief that it was possible for me. And I, and I felt like the only way to get that was to educate myself. And so learning, reading, and I needed testimonials. I needed to hear the story of the girl that was a waitress earning two fifty an hour uh, plus tips who got into real estate and now she's worth $5 million. I need to hear those sure. stories. So it was just all about developing my belief that no this is real it works for people and i can be one of those people so that's you know it took i I did that for six seven months just meetups trying to meet with investors reading podcasts studying that's what i did what about your local local investment club yes i did i uh, went to a mig meeting uh, I actually met you there. You know, it's you know, it's funny that you said that because before I listened to the old podcast last mm-hmm. night, I remember thinking, "How did I meet Stephen?" And it wasn't but like ten seconds later. <laughs> that's how you said because I forgot. Yeah, I met you. Totally met you at the the meetup. Um, you did a because you would do like an intro class. You'd like a getting started, getting started right, getting started right. And so I came early for that, sat through that, and then at the end of that, you were like, you know, I love to help anybody get started. Just reach out to me and let me know if you're interested. And so as soon as you were done, I walked beeline to you, mm-hmm. and I just said, hey, man, I'm interested. I want to meet with you. And then you were like, yeah, just come on by my office. And I remember I came to your office, and we sat, and we talked for like three or four hours. Mm-hmm. And I just remember leaving going, man, this guy just spent four hours with some kid who's like oh I want to get started with real estate I have no idea what to do or what to say and then you gave me kind of some directions you were like hey go out there and start trying to find deals and I was like well how do I do that and you're like go drive for dollars it's it's a it's a very inexpensive way go look at doing direct mail and so I did, did you, bo- you did that I did both of those and I don't know if you remember you you were actually I would call. I felt so bad because I would call you every time I had a potential something that I would just be yeah. like, "Hey, man, I'm sorry, I'm calling you again, but you know, I found this house. This seller wants seventy thousand. I think it's worth a hundred. And you'd be like, "Hey, man, there's not enough room in that. That's not a deal." And so yeah. I learned a lot of how to figure out what because because I would always talk to you and you would always break down to me why that would work or why it wouldn't work. And so sure. after calling you a couple times trying to do a deal with you 
I started to learn like okay this is what a deal looks like okay man these guys want to be in at this price and okay I started getting an idea you even came and looked at a couple yeah. of them that were like potential mm -hmm. and you would estimate the rehab right there on the spot and I used to just think man I will never be able to just walk in the house be in there for five minutes and know oh yeah this is going to cost 25 grand you do yeah. plenty of them you will <laughs> as you know now as, as I know now but I just thought that was so impressive that you could just walk through in five minutes you could just instantly know what and so but I was learning you mm -hmm. know, I was learning, okay, and you would be talking, he's like, yeah, it's going to need a new roof, and that's going to be about this, and it's going to need this, and so yeah, that's that's just the progression, it's just what I feel like successful people do is this, they keep learning, they just keep learning, and part of it is just putting yourself out there. I remember when I came to talk to you, I was so nervous, because I was just, I, I don't know why in my mind I felt <laughs> like if this guy does not accept me into the real estate investing world, I'm doomed. <laughs> But that's what I felt. Sure, I, I sure. felt like I got impressed. You know what, stuff. though? To, to, to halt on that thought process right there, I think a lot of people who are new in real yeah. estate think the exact same thing. And I think it paralyzes them to the point where they're done. Yeah. Fear will yeah. take over. Uh, nervousness. I mean, whatever it is, I think a lot of people get hung up right there and they quit. Yeah. And you're not going to get over that. No. You just got to do it with that. So you just got to take all that baggage with you and just go do it. You're not going to get to a point where you like don't have any fear. Sure. You just got to be courageous and you just got to do it. Because, man, I was super scared. Then I met you and it was like, okay, this guy's you know, just a normal guy. He's down to earth, wants to help, and genuinely wants to help. And did, I never sensed that you felt bothered by the times I would mm -hmm. call you, you know. And, and I tried not to. I tried to be sensitive to your time and not just inundate you, but... Yeah, those are and, and I'm like that now with guys that are trying to get sure. into it. I love when they call me and, and say, "Hey, can you look at this?" And I try to make myself available as much as I can. Now, how, now how how supportive was your wife through all this process, especially in the early? Because because I mean, would you probably agree that the earliest times were maybe some of the most difficult sure. when you're getting started? Yeah. How was she through all of this? She was always supportive, and I think that's super important. Um, uh, she wasn't very active in what I was doing like she wasn't doing things but she was always there for moral support and encouragement so even times when I would come home and just be like gosh can't find a deal or man this sure. is that didn't appraise for what it was supposed to or man the, whatever the, the thing was she was always there to give me encouragement well because you're both I mean you're, you I, I brought that up because she's working full-time at her career mm -hmm. you're working full-time with the band and yeah. I'm gonna assume that you probably worked mostly night gigs correct? night and weekends yeah so you spent spent most of your time uh, starting out in real estate during the days yeah. and uh, daytime hours. Yeah, working business hours and yeah. uh, trying to find deals and, and working with Robert uh, to, to help uh, sell turnkey deals. Now, which now let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so you're out here hustling. Uh -huh. you're, you're driving for dollars. You're doing direct mail marketing. Mm -hmm. Did anything happen with that? Yeah, yeah. I found it. Uh, did, did a deal. Um, it's interesting because I found these two little houses up, the first deals I ever found, two little houses up in Berkeley. Uh The seller wanted $20,000 per house, and they were both rented for seven fifty. dollars And they needed no work, right? And so I went to Robert, and I was just like, I found the first two houses I want to buy. Like, help me buy these houses. Mm -hmm. And... Robert at the time was like, man, you, I just don't think your cash position is strong enough. Uh, man, I think what would be better is let me just pay you for finding these deals. We'll sell them and, you know, I'll help you mm -hmm. buy. So we did that, and that was the first money I ever made in real estate. And I think he paid me six grand a house Jesus as great. like a, just a finder's fee because the, the spread was so, the spread incredible, was great. so incredible. So that was my first ever deal that I did. And then since then, bought found you know sir i don't know the number i don't keep count, but it's a lot you know found a lot of deals sold a lot of deals uh bought a ton to keep and so yeah now how did you because you work with uh my good friend robert field over at discount property warehouse yeah how talk about how that came upon yeah so part of what you when i met with you the first time you were like hey it's all about the deal go find the deals so I was doing that, and I ran across one of their marketing pieces in the in the newspaper, or I think it was on Craigslist. Sure. And they were like, "Oh, this East Memphis house, which I knew was worth like a hundred thousand," and they were like, "You could buy this for forty five thousand." 
And so I'm calling that marketing piece. I'm like, hey, I see this ad. And they're like, yeah, come to the office and we can talk. Needless to say, there was no house. It was just a marketing piece sure. to get <laughs> potential buyers in the door. It was just marketing. And I didn't know that. I didn't know people did that. I thought if yeah. there was something online saying it's a house for sale, there's a house for sale. But I realized very quickly when I showed up that, you know, that those guys were trying to sell me turnkey real estate. Sure. They thought you wanted to buy exactly. and hold as an yeah, investor. They, they, they thought I was a buyer because that's what the, the ad was you know, targeted to people that want to buy properties sure. and hold. And so um, I show up and I'm talking to them and then and then within minutes I'm like, okay, this is a set, they're trying to sell me. And so I just kind of was like, hey guys, uh, I hate to interrupt the sales thing. Uh, I appreciate it. Y'all doing a great job, but I'm not, I don't really want to be sold. I, I want to be doing what you're doing. Like, can I, how can I do what you're doing? How can like, I join the team? Yeah. And, and they were super impressed by that. And then uh, Robert was just like, well, okay, I see this guy's got some, some talent. Just based on our conversation, he was like, all right, as, a, as like a weeding out process, he's like, well, go get your real estate license. And if you, you know, go get your license. And then if you get your license, then come back and we'll. And I think in his mind, he's thinking, we'll never see that guy again. And sure. then uh, two weeks later, I show up and I'm like, hey, man, I got my license. Here we are. And he's like, no, no, no. I mean, your Tennessee state license. And I was like, yeah. He's like, you got it in two weeks? I said, yeah, I'm serious. And then the rest is history. We just He just immediately took me in. And now, when you start, when you, when you joined his team, what role did they put you in? What did, what did you start doing? Because still, you're still new in real estate. You still have a yeah. lot to learn. Right. What did they, what did they start having you do? Uh, I think what we called it is special projects <laughs> manager. And what that really means. I know the name of that well. <laughs> And what that means is, man, you just do whatever we need you to do. You just do what we're going to tell you to do. <laughs> and that's where I started, man. It was runs to Home Depot or low, Lowe's. Hey, go sit for this power turn on at MLG and W. Go sit for a four-hour window. Oh, man, I hated that. Can you go collect rent it for me? <laughs> so, yeah, just what, but I knew that if I hung around these guys, I would learn the business. And so I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to get my foot in there. And it was not, it was humbling. It was, it was not, you know, anything I was bragging about doing, you know, it was all kind of grunt work. But over time, I got to learn the business. I got to see how they bought houses. I got to see renovations. So then my role transitioned from that to construction manager. Now, all of a sudden, I was putting together the scopes of work. I was running the construction. Pro so gained a ton of experience, and I got to mm -hmm. see what the budgets were and how we spent money on those. Then it went from construction manager to, hey, we think you might have some skill selling houses and so now I'm learning how to sell and I'm getting on the phone and I'm talking to clients and I'm, ge I'm I'm developing yet again another skill how to talk to clients how to sell them property so yeah so I just went from grunt man to construction man to sales guy and I kind of still function in that sales role like the company mm -hmm. now I love it yeah so obviously you're selling houses to investors mm -hmm. when do you decide to buy property yeah, um, shortly after those two first deals, Patrick Burleson, who is another guy I work with in the office, because uh, I've been telling him, like, look, I just want to buy rentals. I want to be, because I, I just mm -hmm. felt strongly that that was the way to true wealth. And so Pat found a deal and just brought it to me. And it was over on Morning Vista. And he, uh, it was 55000 They wanted 55000 It was currently rented for nine fifty. And I mean, it needed a little bit of work, but it was rented. So sure. my plan was, man, I just want to buy it, maintain that tenant. And then when they move out at some point, I will handle any issues. So I did, uh, I actually borrowed the money from you guys, uh, got the loan, uh, didn't do anything to it because it was tenanted. So sure. I didn't do any rehab, got it appraised and it appraised for like 105 without doing anything to it. So needless to say, it was a it was a zero down deal. I had no money invested. So basically what Steven's talking about is the Burr strategy. Absolutely. We never used to call it that. No, we didn't then. call it that. We just used to call it no money down yeah. investing or little yeah. to no money down yeah. uh, deal, which basically what he's saying is, is he borrowed private money mm -hmm. to purchase the home, mm -hmm. and if there would have been repairs, and if the numbers were could've good, could have borrowed, borrowed that. Yeah. So essentially, it's zero down on the front end, mm -hmm. and it takes, let's just call it two to three months from start to finish for your refinance out, mm -hmm. pay the private lender yeah. off, there now you you've go. got cash flow and rental Long property. Long-term pro yeah. permanent so, financing on the property. So when you said you know about a $100,000 value, rather than traditionally putting 20, 25% down plus closing costs and being out of pocket somewhere in the twenty to $30,000 range, you're like 
2500 to maybe $3,000 on the high side in this example, right? Well, I mean, it was even less than that. I yeah. think the only thing I paid out of pocket was my appraisal costs. Because I rolled all the the back end closing costs. There you go. Alone because I had the spread. Sure. You know, I bought it for fifty five. It appraised for one hundred five. They would yeah. loan me up to seventy five thousand. So I just rolled in the back end closing costs into the long term loan. And so, really, the only out of pocket expense I had there was the six hundred dollar appraisal. Wonderful. Now, how many properties do you own, and do you still buy them that same way? I still buy them that way. We've got twenty two now. Good God. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Because I felt like it was yesterday. You only had like six or yeah. seven. <laughs> well, we couple of duplexes. And okay, so, so here's the question now. Yeah. You've hit that twenty property limit. Mm-hmm. So you have, I'm going to assume, about ten under your belt, and your wife has the same. Yes. Now, do you have a, because obviously we're, you're not going the conventional route anymore. Do you have a different lender that's? Do, you know, we, yes. The, the idea is that I'm going to refinance all of this into like a commercial portfolio loan and then reset the yes. personal loans that I can go do. The idea. Correct. And I've got a guy that I'm trying to work with. I know who that is. Yeah, you know who it is. I'm not going to say his name. He can do it. He can do it if he can return an email or a phone call. <laughs> so, you know, that's the that's the challenge. I listen, it's always a challenge. <laughs> Man, that's incredible. 22 properties. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever think that like 5 years ago you'd own 22 no. investment properties? No, man. Let me tell when we started my strategy was because we were making a little bit of money, but I thought in my mind the only way to buy was 20% down model. And, you know, when you buy a house of 70 grand, you're talking, you know, it's eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000. So it's like, I didn't have that kind of money. Yeah. So we thought we're going to buy FHA. 3.5 percent you're down. talking about like your primary residence right right yeah but yeah this is what this is what our strategy was to build we were like let's buy a house let's buy it as a primary let's buy it FHA put 3.5 percent down we got to live in it for a year and then we'll go buy another primary FHA 3.5 percent down then we'll turn the one we just moved out of into a rental you'll just keep like year after year, year, one after house year, year. You buy one house a year you got to live in it a year then let's go buy the next one. and that was the strategy that was our strategy so it would take 10 years to buy 10 houses i know i you know i talked to a lot of clients that are like my goal is to buy one house for the next x amount of years and i'm like oh that's so slow yeah. why do you want to do it that way that's pain that's painful it, it was pain it, but that i it was a lack of education i didn't know you could buy this way where what's called now today is the burr. I didn't know you could do that. And so when I learned how to do that, it was like, oh, well, the, my paradigm shifted. It was like, well, I could buy five a year or, or I mean, I could, as long as I can find the deal, I can buy. So it's just now, now let's just go find the opportunities that fit this, this model. And in a, in a way, I feel like I'd have more properties if I didn't know how to do this. Cause in a way it's like, I don't want to buy anything if it doesn't, if it's not like a zero down, I, I'm sadly the same way. I I have I get I see some good deals and I pass on them because I got to put in five or six. Uh, yeah, I don't want to put. It's like I don't want to put ten grand down. Yeah, which which is I wonder, silly. I wonder if that's short sightedness. It is because because we're spoiled. Yeah, we're spoiled. And so that yeah, the twenty two, all of my deals except one, except one, and we've got two that we're in the refinance process now. So we'll see how that shakes out. But one. All of them were like that, where it's like I'm literally just paying for the appraisals, you yeah. know, because the, the spreads were so big. There's just one one I did up on stage, coach, where it didn't appraise for what I estimated to appraise, so I brought about six grand to the table on that. Um, but other than that, you know, you're boo-hoo, talking about boohoo, right? I, yeah, you're talking about 22 properties with less than eight, um, less than ten thousand dollars, sure, exposed to control 22 properties. Mm-hmm. So it's it's incredible. I mean, it's it's awesome to hear that. Now, obviously, real estate has not always probably been perfect at times. Uh, is there a struggle or two that you that maybe come to mind that you could ex- you could discuss maybe what that was, what was going on, and how you eventually overcame it? Yeah, um, I placed a professional tenant. That was that was an interesting uh, battle. If you will, I know exactly the type you're talking about. Yeah, man. So, you know, and here's the thing: I have placed a lot. I have gotten better at this, but I still at times do this. Where, if a property is not renting in the speed that I feel like it should rent, I just start to slowly lower my expectation of the tenant. Mm-hmm. And this was the case on one of my houses. It'd been on the market about 45 days, which normally stuff rents in two or three weeks. So, I. 
it was getting long and I'm starting to feel that tension of like my sure. house isn't rented, I need it to be rented. I don't usually ever accept anyone who's had a bankruptcy in the last five years. It's part of one of our criteria. Sure. Well, this girl comes to me and she's like, uh, yeah, I had a bankruptcy. It was discharged a year ago. Normally, that's a pass. Yeah. But because I was feeling that Because, because we're at 45 days now, you're like, I'm uh, feeling it. I'm feeling that pressure. So I'm like, okay, you got to pay a double deposit. And I'm thinking like a double deposit is going to protect me. So I was like, yeah, I'll work with you, but you got to do a double deposit, first month's rents, which she, which she did. And she paid great for about four months, but then month five, she just didn't pay. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? I filed uh, evictions because she wouldn't respond to me. And she continued She continued it twice. So she, she, she showed up to court and was like, Your Honor, I'm not ready. And so they gave her an extension. They did that twice. Uh, so I think she bought herself another, like, four weeks doing that. Then she filed bankruptcy, right, as that. Which that delays about another two to three three, four weeks. Yeah, d- another two two or four weeks. And so it was just then, you know, we, we finally got the eviction and we finally got the service and we, uh, you know, for a while they couldn't serve her. So it was like it took three weeks to get her served because she knew that this was coming. So she was just like, I don't know how she just could not, could, was beating the server. But did, 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 did you guys actually have to set her out with the move-out crew? We did. We did. She stayed to the bitter end. Were you there? I was. Of course I was there. Uh, is there like some sort of like personal satisfaction of course watching your items get thrown <laughs> it's out? It's terrible to say, but... It's not terrible to say. <laughs> listen, listen, they're stealing from you they is are. what they're doing. They it's are. like I would be there videotaping that. I mean, I, I, I can't say that I wouldn't have some choice <laughs> words of yeah. enjoyment yeah. while that's going on, but they're stealing. Yeah, of course I was there, and it did, it did feel... It did feel good because she wasn't she wasn't the type of person that was like fell on hard times. I think she strategically knew she knew what she was doing and she was trying to milk that process sure. out for as long as she could. So you know that was a, that was a situation that was tough and very frustrating. And really, that was my first eviction period. I had never done yeah. an eviction before, so it was like not only is this my first eviction, it's my I'm I'm dealing with like a, someone who knows the tenant laws and is milking that to stay in the house for free as long as That's they right. can. So that was tough. I'm sure, that was a learning experience. Oh man, it was. You know, it just made me go. I don't care how long my house is vacant. I'm just gonna wait for the right tenant because um, what I spent in costs to get her out and then to fix up the property after she had left would have far I could have waited another six months for a tenant and made broke done Absolutely. better if I would have, if I would have read somebody that would have just stayed Absolutely. a year you know or two years so um yeah it's almost always better to just wait for the right tenant so I learned that lesson the hard way there's been other things that just like appraisals coming in low sure um, that's something we deal with. And, I, you know, that's only happened to me once on my personal stuff. But, you know, we sell turnkey, and that happens a lot. You know, sure. we sell somebody something, and it's like you got to kind of deal with that and figure it out. And, um, yeah, rehab's coming in higher than what they cost overruns. Cost overruns. You know, you didn't see this thing or do know this thing. It just happened to me on these duplexes I'm working on. Did a beautiful renovation. Um the house is a little older, so the dryer is actually in a shed in the backyard. Mm-hmm. And and I'm like, I don't want my tenants having to go outside, walk down, you know, and do. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put stackables in the in the house. And I'm like, okay, great, yeah, yeah. Never crossed my mind that oh, I gotta run two twenties to this space to put the stackables in. Now you're up, up, upgrading electrical. Wasn't planning on doing that initially when I bought the house, and so. Tenant moves in. I got a stackable unit. I, it never crossed my mind I had to do this. And my it's not working. Appliance guy goes is like, you ain't got no two twenty plug here. And I'm like, <laughs> so this thing goes. But now I got a tenant. So now it's just like you got to get it done. I got to get it done. So now the electrician is going in, and the electrician is like, well, we can't. You can't. You can't pull this load on this fuse box. You gotta, you gotta upgrade this. To, and so, uh, there you go, twenty five hundred dollars. Kaboom! Place. Congratulations. Congratulations. All because man. you're trying to be All the right nice guy. To, yeah, I should have just made them walk, to, <laughs> walk their clothes out to the thing. So anyway, we got it done, and she's happy. And so, but those are kind of things that will happen in real estate, and you just gotta be prepared to know that it's not always gonna go. It, it never goes perfect. Actually, there's no. always something. If this was easy, everybody'd do it. All right. So. 
interesting stories. I'm sure we could yeah. trade all day long. All day, yeah. Now, how does a guy like yourself stay motivated? Because, I mean, here's the thing. You've been in full, full-time real estate now for about six, six and a half years, mm-hmm. going on seven. And, I mean, what, what do you do personally to, whether it be, I mean, and I'll kind of cross question this with, like, education. What, what does a guy like yourself do to keep the motivation up to educate yourself? What kind of stuff are you doing? Yeah. I always believe in reinventing yourself. So I always try to reinvent myself every five years. You know, in five years, I, I just don't want to get, I know how to buy single family houses. I could do that with my eyes closed. So I start thinking, well, what's the next iteration of myself? And I, like, now I'm getting into apartment complexes. And I feel those same feelings I felt. Because it's something different. Oh, it's something different. It's scary. It's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't quite know what I'm doing. But then I just go back to my obsession phase mm-hmm. where I'm just downloading podcasts, reading books. I've, I've bought 30 books on apartment complex invest, investing. And, and I've joined a coaching program, paid $20,000 to be a part of it. Good. Gracious. You know, and I know I'm a lot. Of, to hear that, though. I know a lot of people. A lot of people balk at that and say you don't need gurus, but I disagree. I think if Michael Jordan... Listen up, people. <laughs> listen up. Right here. If Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player, in my opinion, of all time... He is the greatest basketball greatest player. Basketball There's no question about that. Needed a coach. I mean, what? why do we feel like in business we don't need coaches? We need people that have done what we want to do, and we should pay them to teach us how to do what they have done. I think what happens, why gurus or t- coaches get such a bad rep is because they have these high priced coaching programs and people pay them but they're not really committed to the process of achieving anything so then they're the ones that go online and there's like don't waste your money what I found to be true is that in most cases I've paid for a lot of paid po- coaching programs the information the value that they gave always to me felt worth what I paid for it sure it's the application that it's, it's, breaks it's down. It's the person who doesn't right. work. Right. It's not the program that doesn't it's work. It's the, pro- the person it's the who person. doesn't work. So, yeah, I, I, I believe. And for me, when I put my money on something like that, I it almost gives me this extra incentive to make the return on investment worth it. So when I go yeah. and drop 20 grand on a coaching program, it's I'm not just going to get those materials and just not read them because I'm like, no, I paid $20,000 for this. I want that investment to pay off. Sure. And so it's a little slower going with apartment complex and breaking into that scene is is tough. But I'm still working at that every day because I'm I just I want to reinvent myself. And and five years from now, after owning you know my I want to buy at least a hundred apartment units. Uh, maybe I'll you want to have a hundred doors. A hundred doors, yeah. And and really want to buy those in in twenty twenty five thirty unit buildings sure. somewhere in that space. Um, so yeah, and then and then when I get there, I'll either feel like I want to step on the gas and scale more and buy more, or I'll be looking to reinvent myself again. So that's kind of what I do to stay motivated, um, just continually feeling uncomfortable. You know, people that feel uncomfortable usually are highly successful people. The moment you start feeling very comfortable, you stagnate. You don't grow. You get you stay the same, but. If I can put myself in uncomfortable, where I'm scared, like I want to be scared. I want to yeah. walk into that thing and be scared. You know, it's funny that you're saying this right now because I'm having a flashback. I'm listening to Grant Cardone's 10x. Yeah, uh, I, I like audiobooks. Yeah, because uh, just I can do it all the time. Yeah, and I'm getting towards the end of the book, and that's exactly what he was. Exactly what you said right there is, is essentially what he said. You know, he's he's talking about a story about how he wants to buy this big apartment complex, and he doesn't know where he's going to get the money, and he doesn't know how he's going to get the financing. This, but he's know he's got to commit to it because yeah, he's committed. He's got the contract. How's he going to make it happen? So, and that's that, what it made me think of. Yeah, that is where you people are pressed in those situations of high pressure, and you sink or you swim. And it's okay if you sink because when you fail, you just get data points. Now you got yeah. data. For your next deal, you can go, okay, I, I structured that wrong. Now, I'm not advocating that people go out there and lose a, t- a bunch of money and do all of that. But I am advocating that people get out there and be uncomfortable, be scared. Now, with your apartment complex, I want to ask you this because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm essentially in a similar position where you're at. Mm-hmm. You know, I have 30-some single-family homes, yeah. just a few more than you. Yeah. I am also interested in multifamily, small apartments, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you find your... Because I see some. I mean, I can go online. I've seen some great ones like in the Cooper Young area, yeah. this and that. 
but where I get held up a little bit is I'm still looking at it from the Burr strategy. Yeah. I want to find the apartment complex that's worth 800000 that I can buy for two hundred and be all in it for 400000 450000 and then I want to refinance. So it's like that's that's what I think of. Yeah. I know that those are very few and far between. I would say yes. Like I haven't found one yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that's going to be hard. And this is... This is why I was like, man, I'm spoiled, and I'm trying to get my mindset out of that. I'm, yeah. I need to be okay with putting money down yes. and having skin in the game. And, and, and it's great for someone who's just getting started to approach it that way. But I think as you start to develop and grow and you've got access to some resources, you need to, as an investor, I, I think you just got to scale and grow. Now, uh, it, the same could be true, and, and part of what I'm the group that I joined, it's all about teaching you how to syndicate capital. Sure. So it doesn't always have to be your capital, Correct. but in apartment complex investing, I just think it's, I mean, the capital's coming from somewhere. Mm-hmm. So whether it's your money or someone else's money, I mean, it's, it's, it's capital intensive and, and you gotta, you gotta find it. And I'm, and I, what I have learned so far about syndicating capital, especially as a new syndicator, no one wants to give me money on my first deal and I have no money invested. Sure. I mean, would you do that? If I came to you and said, hey, man, I want to buy this apartment complex. I, I need to raise $500,000, man. Give me $100,000. You're going to find a lot of no's. Exactly. I, I just think that's a hard a hard thing. So you got to be willing. You got to, A, have some money, and you got to be willing to put it at risk. Sure. Just like the investors that you're going to, to ask to put at risk. Now, I want to get started with some smaller deals, 20 unit, 25 units, because I have the capacity to do that on my own. Mm-hmm. And I want to use that as proof of concept. So sure. I want to buy maybe one or two 20, 25 unit buildings. I think if you get those first two done, just like you're talking about, yeah, I think you'll find it a whole lot easier to get yeah. the money that you need. Yeah, because then now I'm going to investors and I'm not, I'm not, hey, start this new thing that I've never done before. It's like, hey, look what I've done. Come be a part of it, as opposed to, you know, I'm I'm thinking about doing this. Would you be in it, in on it with me? You know, let me know how that goes. I will. I will. <laughs> what what would you what are some things that maybe real estate has done for you or maybe provided for your family that would not have maybe been possible if you would have kept on the path of say musician yeah well i mean gosh just my cash flow position is much stronger uh definitely higher income Mm -hmm. Uh, most of it has been financial um but there's a lot of emotional and psychological advantages that come from doing well financially that I didn't necessarily know would be part of the deal. Sure. You know, so uh, yeah, just on the financial aspect, you know, cash flow, strong. Currently at this point, now I haven't gone out and done a bunch of crazy things with my money. Like, I still live in my house on Powers Road. I know you, you know? do. And, you know, I, I, could, I, I could go and buy a big old house in Germantown or Carlyville, but we just haven't done that. Um, so my expenses are relatively low, but currently right now I'm in a position where I don't have to work. My cash flow from my properties can pay my expenses on a monthly basis, no problem. Now my expenses are low, granted, sure. but I don't have to work. And that's just a very freeing place to be. And real estate has done that. You know, um, I went from a negative $200,000 net worth be- went, went in 2014 to a 1.2 million dollar net sure worth. that's cool i'm a millionaire it's cool. Really cool cool you know what I'm saying? so on paper right on paper you know <laughs> in equity not yeah. not in cash in the bank yeah. but you know but that's cool and um you know just just being able to earn a earn a higher income because real estate in itself when you do the transactional stuff buying and selling flipping wholesaling that stuff's highly lucrative um so that's afforded me you know trips i've taken various trips i mean gosh we went to hawaii i want to say two years ago and i told my wife i said we went for like 13 days or something Jeez. Like that. and i told her i said i don't care if we spend fifty thousand dollars we're gonna do whatever we want we're gonna buy the the front row seat we're gonna we are not gonna let money like hinder our decision making sure. on this trip 
And so we went, and I'll tell you, man, I got to experience how the 1%, man, how they live, man. It was great. It was just like we went to all these shows, and we bought the, you know, we bought the platinum package, and we bought the super ambassador package, <laughs> and we did it. And they were like, card us in, and it was just like, no line, no way. People I mean, were like, who's that? Yeah, who's that guy? Dude. Get my camera out. Yes, it, it, was, it was fun. It was cool. It was, a, it was amazing time. And I just, I just was like, man, God, that's how I want to live. Now, I want to live where... Money is not at the forefront of my decision making. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, money is always going to be a concern. I think people that have a lot of money still are concerned about money. But you get to a point where money is not the driving decision maker yeah. in your in how you live. And so yeah. that's where that's ultimately where we want to get to. Um, but yeah, you know, been able to take my family. I, I paid for my entire family to go up to Cabo and have a trip there, and that was super fun. And we actually have never been on like a family vacation like that. Our family, anytime we traveled, it was for some church thing, you know. So we never like did a family vacation where it was not. It was just fun, you know. And so that was great, hanging out with my folks, my parents, my siblings, and we. we and all didn't, went. didn't you also take your whole family to Africa? No, 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 no. No, I didn't take well, my whole family. God, what was it? But did you go there? We were supposed to go. Ah, uh, me I'm, and Eunice were supposed to go, but okay. they changed the the uh, the government there. You used to be able to do visa on arrival for pleasure or for business. Okay. And then a month before we we're supposed to fly out, they changed it to visa on arrival is only for business people oh okay and so i had people and relatives in Ni in nigeria telling me no just come on and come and i was like but they they won't let us do yeah, I'll, just, I'll just get held up at the airport and they, they were like well just tell them you're here on business i'm like you want me to lie to the nigerian government and tell them I'm, and then they asked me well what business and then i'm like uh i'm like and they were like well then just bring two thousand dollars in cash and if they give you a hard time just bribe them oh yes this dude. is what my this is what my contacts over there were telling me to do and i'm like i'm not flying out of the country with my strategy to get in the country to lie or to bribe the official you probably don't want to end up in like a nigerian prison <laughs> exactly so i was just like no nope, we're gonna cancel the trip we'll take the four <sighs> months it you need to get your visa sure. and we'll just do it the we'll reschedule we'll, we'll reschedule it love so, it man yeah what do you see happening in the next two to five years? Where do you want to be? Two to five years, if I want to have conquered this multifamily beast that I am wrestling right now, and I want to have 100 units, uh, multifamily, in two to five years, um, I mean, that's my biggest goal. Along with that, I would say more on the two-year side, I want to get to my, really more the one-year side, uh, my target goal, weight, man, because health has now become a big thing that, is super important to me and it I see a correlation between successful people and their health I, mm -hmm. you know because the same set of skills you need to be healthy and be at a good weight are the same set of skills you need to be successful and financially free discipline discipline so um, I have made that a core fundamental part of what I'm seeking after so I've lost like 65 pounds man Probably, I don't know, not since the last time you've seen me because I've seen you recently. Yeah. But, yeah, I've lost 65 pounds, and I've got another 40 to go. And so I want to, you know, that's a big, big Heck goal. Yeah. Of mine. I want to lose 40 more pounds. And so in two to five years, I see myself with six-pack abs, mm. 100, <laughs> 100 multifamily units, and then trying to figure out the next iteration of myself whether that's going to be commercial buildings. I've always thought it'd be cool to be the guy that owns the building that Starbucks rents from. I don't know mm -hmm. why I have that in my mind, but I'm going to do that at some point. I'm mm -hmm. going to own a Starbucks building, and a mm -hmm. Starbucks is going to be my tenant. Not, not very many people can say that, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Man, you've unloaded a lot of good information. Like yeah. I said, I appreciate you coming in today. Absolutely. What would you say... Do you have a final thought or a word of advice for anybody who's watching this who may have been you six and a half years ago? Yeah, for sure. Two, two things that I think without these two things, I don't get to where I am today. One is courage. And that is just doing stuff even though you're scared out of your mind to do it. Whether And, and that, that can be on all levels. Like for me, it was coming and talk to you who in my mind, you were like sitting 
at the tower of the real estate mountain. You're a trip, and, man. And the gatekeeper of all. And you, you were the person. I don't know why I had this irrational thought. Because I, you know, I liked, I liked that you had that thought though. Keep, keep thinking of me as that <laughs> yeah. guy. Right? So I'm like, man, this guy's gonna open the gate for me to pass, or he's gonna turn me back away. And so I was so scared, but I did it anyway. Uh, first house we bought. I remember when we signed the closing documents. My hands were shaking because I, I did not have the money. If like a water heater would have went out. I would, I would really didn't know how I would pay for that. Sure, you know, because I didn't have, I didn't have the money. So it was just like being scared and being afraid, but also being courageous. You have to have that to do anything in life, and it ain't just, you know, investing in real estate. It's anything that is of any, uh, anything that's worth anything. You know, you can just be average and not really accomplish anything, and you don't ever have to be courageous, and you can be comfortable and whatever, and that's okay. For some people, that's what they want to do, sure. and that's great. But if you want to accomplish something and you want to do great things, you're going to have to be courageous. You're going to have to be do stuff that you don't have all the answers in front of you. You can't really answer all the questions, but you got to just get out there and do it anyway. So that's one. And then two, I really, really believe in a mentor slash coach. I don't, I'm, I'm not where I am today had it not been for you, had it not been for people like Robert, sure. Patrick Burleson. These guys all poured into my development. Because well, like you said, you, you people like us that you just mentioned, we helped you master the level that yeah. you're at right now. Yeah. Now because you're looking at the next level, which is multifamily apartment type stuff, you are, in theory, picking a whole new set of mentors or a program for that right. because you're at you're trying to reach to a different level. So, so I got to go yeah. learn from the guys that own 3,000 units. Who better to learn from if I want to buy 100 units? Why would Who better to learn from than the That's guys right. that own 3,000 units? Those are the guys I want telling me how to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hosting a, a meetup at the end of this month, Multifamily 101. I'm not leading the presentation. I found someone local who's going to come in and talk yeah. multifamily because... I'm not that guy. Yeah. So I know what you mean. So those two things, courage and mentors or coaches. And if you can find a mentor that will pour into you and you don't have to pay for it, great. But if you got to pay for it, pay for it. Whatever way you can get it, get it. And that's, you know, and a lot of people don't know this. Robert, I paid three ninety five a month. I know you did. As a desk fee <laughs> to be an errand boy. I was paying to, to go sit at Lowe's and go do this and go do I was I paid three ninety five a month for a year until finally Robert just called me in his office and was just like, Man, listen, you've been paying this desk fee. You you bring a tremendous value. I don't want you to pay that anymore. Yeah. But I because I was willing to do what sure. I had to do to, to learn. So, Absolutely. Um yeah, those are my those are the two biggest things I think given to new people. Be courageous. You're going to be afraid. If you're waiting to try to overcome that to do anything, you'll never do anything because no. it never goes away. You'll always be afraid until you get enough education and experience that you can do something without thinking about it, which is where you are with single families, where I am with single mm -hmm. families. And then you got to go to the next thing. And that's going to be scary and you're going to have those same issues, but you be courageous and you do it. And then get you a good coach and get you a good mentor. Boom. There you go. Love it, man. Well, listen, like I said, I appreciate you coming in. Yeah. This interview was way better than the last one. Yes, it was. <laughs> and I can't wait to do this uh, again here. In, after in, I, in after two, I got two to three years. units, man. And right. It's like, hey, come on, tell me. And then I, I give all the pearls, man. I give all the secrets away. I love it. So, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. Stephen Ekandana, successful Memphis real estate investor, taking his skills to the next level with multifamily. I love it. I can't wait to see what happens. So if you stuck with us through this interview, which you should have, because this was awesome, <laughs> make sure you click that like button, hit the subscribe, leave us a comment. Uh, if you are looking for real estate education and mentoring, we do offer a program at realestatewealthcoaching.com. Check it out. We've got some free training you can sign up for, and you can also schedule a consultation, uh, and you can speak with myself, and we'll see if our program is a good fit for you. So I appreciate you coming in, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. We'll see you in the next one. All right, man.